Now, you may be looking at this video and thinking, The Hobbit, the Battle of the Five Armies? But your Imperial Majesty, if you are going to criticise the military elements of the cinematic adaptions of Tolkien's Tales of Middle-earth, why don't you start with the Lord of the Rings films? To answer this, I must explain why I made a video about the problems in The Last Jedi. I made a military analysis of The Last Jedi because the bad tactics, strategies and inconsistencies destroyed any chance I had of enjoying the film. I dislike The Last Jedi for many reasons, but the rubbish combat and military elements of the film stick out like a sore thumb, because The Last Jedi contains a lot of scenes dedicated to the subpar action. In the case of The Lord of the Rings, the tactics make little sense, especially the tactics of Helm's Deep, where the Urukai stand underneath the walls with no coherent battle plan. Some shoot arrows at the defenders, some climb ladders, some stand around doing nothing, and some try blowing up the wall with gunpowder killing any of their comrades standing in close proximity to the bomb. It is stupid to be sure. Nevertheless, the Siege of Helm's Deep is a cinematic marvel. Large numbers of extras, the life-size castle of Helm's Deep, the props, the costumes, the scale, and the general aesthetic of a nighttime siege in the rain is epic. The military tactics may be flawed to say the least, but because nearly everything is real, the action looks plausible, and the bad tactics are easy to ignore while watching. In short, the bad tactics in the Lord of the Rings films did not reduce my enjoyment of those films. The bad tactics in The Last Jedi did. I think this is largely down to execution on Peter Jackson's part, but more on that later. Now before I get into the analysis properly, I would just like to say that I will largely be ignoring the actions and feats and the heroics of the main characters such as Gandalf and Thorin. I do this not necessarily because their feats are realistic, wise or plausible, but because while conducting this analysis, I must pay my dues to the fantasy genre. Asking how this character is able to keep fighting and not die while surrounded by ten goblins is as productive as reading the Iliad and asking how Achilles doesn't get tired killing everyone towards the end of the book. The answer to both these questions is because of the genre. A work of fantasy such as the Middle-earth films or the Iliad concern themselves with the epic hero or heroes, men who are able to do things we wouldn't expect normal men to do. The artist then, when producing such scenes, does not do so because he is ignorant of war, but because he is creating a fantasy tale. The other reason is because there are so many ridiculous scenes where one of the main characters does something insane, or so over the top, that I'd be here for hours discussing all the problems in said scenes. If I were to focus on those scenes, I'd have to start from the beginning with the first film, An Unexpected Journey, and go from there, and I do not want to talk about that barrel scene. God give me strength. So without more to do, let's get into the film. I shall give a disclaimer now, that the footage I will be examining comes from the extended edition of the film. However, I have only watched the original edition in full, so there may be some discrepancies. The battle doesn't start until we are an hour into the film. It all starts when the army of dwarves led by a CGI Billy Connolly arrive to find an army of elves standing outside the Lonely Mountain, led by... Someone who is either best friends with a plastic surgeon, or with a photoshop artist. Oh, and there are also some human peasants in the ranks of elves. But not that you see them very much in the next few scenes. For some reason, the humans seem to be very egalitarian because there are women in their ranks, because apparently there are no meaningful physical differences between men and women. CGI Connolly tells the elves to go, but the elves and the ragtag band of humans aren't threatened, so Connolly decides to order his sheep cavalry to charge. The goats! Whatever, these fictional goats look like fictional sheep. There's nothing to criticise here on a tactical level, but I don't think the gaps between the rows of infantry are wide enough for mounts of that size to charge through. The best friend of a plastic surgeon, seriously, I don't think this elf can actually blink, orders his elves be ready to meet the dwarven charge, and to let loose a volley of arrows. A sensible tactic, but the dwarves possess a secret weapon. Oh, 
Now, provided the dwarves had the technical know-how to make ballista bolts which could do this, I don't see this being beyond the realms of possibility. Missiles such as these might well knock some arrows out of the sky, and save some lives. The hard part to believe is how the dwarven engineers operating these ballista were able to correctly predict the height the arrows would reach before falling, and then shoot their bolts in time to meet the arrows. In theory, however, such a tactic would actually work. These bolts also probably would hurt some men or elves in the ranks, so I have very little to criticise here. The Elven King orders his archers to shoot another volley, but somehow the dwarves have reloaded their ballista and interrupt this volley as well. For some reason, the Elven King orders his archers to not bother firing arrows anymore, even though he has enough elves to act as spearmen and archers. The elves would surely be able to reload their bows more quickly than the dwarves would be able to reload their ballista, meaning some arrows would get through. Moreover, the dwarves would not be able to fire their own ballista without risking targeting their own soldiers, as by this point, both armies would be engaged in a melee. There was no reason for the elves to stop firing their arrows, and every reason to continue doing so. The sheep cavalry reach the elven line, and start ploughing through the elves like a duck swims through water. This is, of course, unrealistic. Cavalry were great in battle until the First World War, but they didn't have the ability to smash into men like this. A horse and any other equivalent animal would break its bones after charging into so many armoured men and elves, and fall down dead. These sheep would have all collapsed after smashing into these ranks. Also, why do the dwarven riders not have lances? The elves actually construct a sensible formation behind their collapsing line. The half-circle formations actually make sense in this situation. The idea is to funnel the dwarven sheep into the half-circles, and then skewer them from all sides with their spears. This is perhaps the most sensible thing anyone does in the whole of this battle. The sheep cavalry aren't shown on screen again, and I have to assume they all died, but luckily the dwarves still have their infantry, and of course CGI Connolly, riding his faithful mount CGI Warboar. As a side, I'm not sure why he didn't charge with the sheep. A chaotic battle ensues until this distracts everyone. The speed in which the worms disappear and the orc armies appear is very fast, and suggests to me that the orcs had to be waiting for the worms to do this. Since the worms are gigantic, I'm interested to know how they managed to tunnel without crushing the orcs sharing the underground with them. If Azog the Snowflake owns giant worms of this size, why doesn't he use them to destroy the dwarves and the elves and not bother with his armies? Those worms seem more than capable. Also, why has he set up his signalling system on the top of a faraway mountain? I know the elves have keen eyesight, and really should have noticed him and his signalling system on the mountain, but I'm unsure about the orcs. Are they even capable of seeing the signals he is displaying? Even if they are capable, it would make more sense for Snowflake and his general staff to be on the ground, with his armies. Giving orders would take less time, and he would actually be near the battle, where he could best see what was happening. Seriously, he must have the eyes of a super eagle to make judgments about what is going on during this battle. Anyway, the dwarves decide to be proactive, and form a line in front of the charging orcs. Now, the camera does its best not to give us a bird's eye view of the dwarven line, but from what I can see, the phalanx is useless. The point of a battle line is to beat the enemy's forces across the entire front, so you cannot be flanked, and there are two ways of doing this. The first way is to have the same number of men as the enemy, so you can expand your line enough to meet the entirety of their battle line. If you have more men, you can try to stretch your line longer than theirs so you can flank them. The second way, if you don't have as many men as the enemy, is to find a region with geographical barriers where you can place your line comfortably. If your line is in between two deep rivers, for instance, the enemy 
even if they have superior numbers, will not be able to flank you, and will be forced to meet you on your terms. There are clearly more orcs than dwarves, and I cannot see any natural obstacles worth noting here. A line like this would be flanked and crushed in minutes, it would be an absolute rout. A better decision would be to stay near the entrance of a lonely mountain, with the elves, as the gateway would provide natural impassable flanks, making outflanking impossible, and also mitigate the superior numbers of the orc army somewhat. The orcs, however, don't seem to want to take advantage of the open field and try outflanking the dwarven phalanx, and instead only spread their forces wide enough to meet the dwarven line head on. How very accommodating. But things get worse. Okay, first, this is the distance between the Dwarven and the Elven armies. How did these Elves get there so quickly, considering they were standing still for at least a minute while the Dwarves were forming their line? Second, why are they not lengthening the Dwarven line? I've already pointed out that the Dwarves have a line which could be easily flanked. Why aren't the Elves trying to complete the line, or protect the flanks, so they are not all surrounded and killed? Thirdly, why are they jumping in front of the phalanx? The phalanx is there to meet the orc charge. Jumping in front of it only stops the phalanx from doing its job, and they are likely to be pushed onto the dwarven spears by the charging orcs while standing there. Which idiotic commander thought that jumping over the phalanx was a wise idea? Anyway, the dwarves decide they are not going to stand on the defensive either, and charge into the fray as well. Unlike the elves, they at least hold formation. But considering that they have inferior numbers, I'm not sure if such a move is at all wise. The elves actually do something sensible, and shoot arrows over the dwarven and elven lines into the orc ranks, but only shoot one volley, apparently so as not to hit the dwarven chariots charging into the battle. The fact that the chariots are even there is ridiculous. There are far too few to be effective as a cavalry unit, and a better use of them would be to keep them behind the dwarven and elven line, with a body of soldiers ready to plug any breaches or breaks in the line acting as part of a reserve force, but apparently everyone wants to charge into battle without thinking. Now, we need to move away from the plain and go into the ruined city of Dale. Why? Because Snowflake gives this order. But this order is nonsensical. I carefully examined the geography of the area from different shots, and made this rough map. Attacking the city does not open a second front, because as seen in the previous shots, the dwarven and elven lines do not extend into the city, and the city does not provide a new position from which to attack them. Azog is a moron. Gandalf gives a wiser assessment of the situation. Azog is trying to cut us off. However, this is not entirely accurate. The only way into the city from this area is to cross the bridge, as the river is rather deep next to the city. So, if the purpose was to cut off the dwarves and the elves, the city need not be taken. The bridge just needs to be defended. But as can be seen in the next few shots, the orc forces don't even focus on the bridge. Also, if the intention was to actually surround and cut off all escape routes with the elves and the dwarves, Azog would have to send some forces to cover the area where the dwarven army appeared. Anyway, so Gandalf, Bilbo, and the non-musical bard with his merry men, uh, sorry, I mean egalitarian, gender-inclusive troop, head towards the city, and later they are shown entering the city apparently unharassed. Why no orc companies or battalions took the initiative of attacking them while they ran across this wide open plain, I have no idea. Anyway, the orcs start entering the city, but not by the bridge. I don't know why the orcs are using their trolls in such a wasteful manner. They use them far more effectively in the Lord of the Rings films. Anyhow, I must reiterate that the orcs shouldn't even be attacking the city. The city is a ruin and is filled with women and children. There are no soldiers inside. 
No tactical or strategic benefits are granted by taking the ruins in this part of the battle. The women and children aren't a threat either. The actual threat lies on the battlefield, where the dwarven and elven armies are currently fighting. Why are the orcs listening to their idiot commander, instead of waiting in line to kill some dwarves and elves? Anyhow, Bard and his troop enter the city apparently without being attacked. They then find a large contingent of orcs and begin fighting. Now, the orcs are wearing heavy armour, are quite tall, and seem to be battle-hardened. Nevertheless, Bard and his troop are somehow able to stand toe-to-toe -to -toe with them. This beggars belief. Back to the battlefield where the real fighting is taking place, the elves and the dwarves are trashing the orcs. <laughs> Now I said I wouldn't comment on the extraordinary feats of the heroes in this film, because the fantasy genre asks us to suspend our disbelief for some things, and I didn't think it would be in good faith to criticise such good feats. But I must say something about this. Peter Jackson the Slim, what were you thinking? When someone picks up a fantasy novel, or switches on a fantasy film, they want to see heroes accomplish great feats, and make great use of arms in combat. They want to see mighty warriors slaying the forces of evil, with great swipes of the sword, or with the power of magic. Not watch a comedian bash people to death with his head. He isn't even bashing orcs with his head, he is gently nudging his skull against the orcs' helmets. Helmets which are made of metal. Nothing about this is even remotely believable. Also, what is the tone even supposed to be in this scene? This is supposed to be the part where the orcs start winning against the dwarves, and things begin to look sticky. And yet, in the midst of all this death, with sad music playing in the background, is a dwarf killing orcs by headbutting them. Peter Jackson the Fat would never have directed a scene like this. Anyway, the reason CGI Iron Skull Connolly is shouting where's foreign is because in the shots before, the elves are shown charging into the city. Why? Presumably either to aid the humans, who passed by the orc lines and went into the city before them, or to try and escape the battle and head back to Mirkwood. Whichever one of these is the actual reason is mostly irrelevant, because both are dumb ideas. Let's ignore the fact that breaking away from the battle to cross this bridge would be nearly impossible without killing nearly every orc on the battlefield, and instead focus on the intended purposes of each possible move. If the idea is to aid the humans, it's a bad move. Why? Firstly, because the humans in the city are insignificant when it comes to winning the battle. Bard's troop isn't worth saving. There aren't many good shots of the troop to probably guess its size, but it looks to be the size of maybe one or two companies. Not a significant military unit. The city itself doesn't have anything in it, and I cannot see any tactical advantages in possessing it. At the beginning of the battle, fortifying the city might well have been a valid tactical option. But now that a section of the wall has been destroyed and it is overrun with orcs, there is simply no point in capturing it, especially when the main battle is happening outside the Lonely Mountain. Secondly, running into the city weakens the dwarven army. In a melee style battle, it is very rarely a good idea to separate one's forces. This case is not an exception. The dwarven army is smaller than the orc army, but together, the elves and the dwarves seem to be more or less a match to the orc army in terms of numbers. Abandoning the dwarves at this stage of the battle only increases the chance that they will be slaughtered, and guess who will be next once they are dead? The elven army may be good, but it still stands a better chance of survival fighting side by side with the dwarves. But what if the reason is self-centred? What if the only reason the elves are fleeing to the city is to break through and escape to Mirkwood? Well, it is still foolish and stupid, but not from a tactical standpoint, if one assumes it is possible to break out with minimal casualties but instead from a strategic standpoint. In the last film, The Desolation of Smaug, an orc infiltration force attempted to sneak into the elven stronghold and kill or capture Foran. Now, although they didn't break into the stronghold, they managed to avoid detection by the elves, 
and attempted to kill the dwarves as they escaped in the barrels, and elven warriors had to kill and chase them away. The fact that the orcs were able to avoid detection from the elves strongly suggests that they are a threat and not to be underestimated. Which brings me to my next point. What makes King Frandriel think that Snowflake will go home once he has destroyed the dwarven army and killed Foran? Snowflake is far more likely to get high on his victory and set out to conquer new lands and pillage new treasures, and why wouldn't he turn his eye to Mirkwood? In all likelihood, the elven army would end up fighting the orcs again if they fled, but this time they would do so in their own homeland, where there would be less room for error. If the elves lose here, the Kingdom of Mirkwood has time to decide on a course of action to defend themselves. If the elves lost a battle in Mirkwood and were defeated, their homes would be quickly marched upon. So then, it would be far wiser to stay and fight the orcs here, instead of going home and waiting for them to come to you. At this point in the film, things get desperate everywhere. Bard's ragtag troop starts losing against the heavily armoured and numerically superior orcs. Who could have seen that coming? The seemingly immortal elves also begin to take casualties, perhaps for the first time, and Iron Skull is shouting for a retreat. Why none of these armies, excluding the orcs, make use of horns to give orders, I do not know. So now we have to go into the Lonely Mountain and examine the goings-on therein. The Lonely King, Foran, is doing a King David and not going out to fight his people's enemies. But while King David's temptation was a woman bathing naked on a roof, King Foran's foil comes from a tremendous amount of gold in his mountain, which if released into general circulation would almost certainly devalue gold as a currency across Middle-earth. He is afflicted with dragon sickness and does not want to lose any of his gold, and so does not want to risk going out into battle, otherwise he could be permanently parted from said gold. So for the first half of the battle, Foran has stayed inside his lonely mountain. Fortunately, just as the dwarves are beginning to be pushed back, Foran snaps out of it, and takes off his armour and approaches his band of twelve dwarves and… wait a minute. Here is the armour Foran is wearing whilst in the depths of his dragon sickness. The robe he is wearing makes it difficult to see large sections of the armour, but from what can be seen, it does seem to be a good suit of armour. I am sure some armour experts in the comment section will come forward and begin educating me on some finer aspects of armour design, but I think everyone can agree on this. That suit of armour would be a far better choice for battle than this. Seriously, that barely counts as a suit of armour. The chainmail doesn't even cover the entirety of his body, there are so many openings, and the chainmail is loose. In fact, the rest of the Merry Dwarves are wearing a similar style of armour, and there is no excuse for this. They are all standing in an area surrounded by suits of armour. Why are they not using any of them? Back outside the entrance to the mountain, Iron Skull has ordered the remainder of his forces to form a line. Meanwhile, Snowflake begins to manoeuvre his forces into position. I do wonder how he is able to coordinate his forces so effectively when he is at least something like five miles away with nothing but a set of loud horns. The horns don't even make a signal when he says wait. Are we to assume then he is sending officers down the mountain to give orders which cannot be expressed over the horns or the flags? This is so inefficient and the fact his armies can remain so disciplined in spite of these inadequacies just isn't realistic or believable. As the trolls start to march forwards, the fat dwarf begins blowing a dwarven horn. You know, it is incredible that Foran and his gang are not lying on the ground at this moment, hands on their ears, screaming in pain from having their eardrums ruptured by that massive bell. It is also incredible that the flying debris didn't hit any of Iron Skull's dwarves. Anyway, nobody has any better ideas, and so everyone charges at the orc army before them. At this moment, the dwarves in Iron Skull's army become really good at throwing javelins, and bring down the trolls with ease. Actually, it seems to be a theme in this film. Trolls are really dangerous and tough until they're not. 
Now the orc line does this. The only way I could see this happening is if the bell and slash or the horn bomba blue was slash were magical, but the film does nothing to say that either were, so I'm going to assume that they were both normal. Alright, so at this point I have to call the stop to the military analysis of this film, mainly because the next load of scenes deal with the heroes doing heroic stuff, and I said before that I don't think it would be fair to criticise those aspects. But come on Jackson, what is this? The other main reason is because the rest of the action scenes can be described thusly. Foreign and gang save the dwarven army, and the morale of the human army gets boosted, and everyone fights with renewed vigour against the forces of darkness. The final orc army then arrives, but is destroyed by the majestic giant eagles and the great bear shifter known as Bjorn. So that is the film, but here is the question. Is this film worse or better than The Last Jedi when it comes to military affairs? I would say, on balance, that The Hobbit, The Battle of the Five Armies, is better. The main problem with The Last Jedi's military elements is simple. Nobody does anything they should. Or, to put it another way, the leaders of both the Resistance and the First Order are characterised by inaction. Why didn't General Weasley fire on the Resistance fleet with the Dreadnought first, instead of the base? Or at least order his Star Destroyers to attack the fleet while his Dreadnought dealt with the base? Why didn't Vice Admiral Pinky slash Purple Hair slash Gender Studies slash Satirical Title tell Poe the plan? Please do not say because she was worried about spies. Nothing in The Last Jedi suggests there was a concern with First Order spies. And do not say it was because she thought Poe was a wild card, because if she thought that, she would have either demoted him further or locked him in a cell. Please sit down. This problem of inaction does not exist in The Hobbit, The Battle of the Five Armies. A different problem exists, however. The leaders of all armies do take action. The problem is, the actions they take and the way they are taken are ridiculous. What is even more ridiculous is such actions actually have a positive effect. While watching The Last Jedi, my reaction to the incompetence was always, why aren't you doing this or that? While watching The Battle of the Five Armies, my reaction to the incompetence was always, why are you doing that and why is it working? Inaction and the inability to take action where it would benefit either side killed The Last Jedi's battles for me. I was frustrated at the end of the film. The ludicrous manoeuvres in the Battle of the Five Armies, on the other hand, just left me in a state of disbelief. Amused disbelief. I believe I have said all I need and want to say on this film. Thank you all for watching, I hope you all have an excellent day. Actually, I have one more thing I want to say. I said earlier in this presentation that Peter Jackson's execution of the battle scenes in the Lord of the Rings trilogy was one of the reasons the questionable tactics are often forgotten and ignored by viewers. While in films such as The Battle of the Five Armies and The Last Jedi, the bad tactics and strategies are noticed and pointed out constantly. What the past Peter Jackson did well, and what Ryan Johnson and the future Peter Jackson didn't do well in their respective films would make an entire video in itself. However, I think the main difference is computer-generated imagery. The use of real actors and actresses in the Lord of the Rings trilogy made the action seem more real and authentic than it actually was, and some of the scenes are iconic because of this. On the other hand, the Battle of the Five Armies, while it still has scenes which contain large-scale conflicts and thousands of opponents engaged in combat, because they are all CGI, the action seems less authentic. This isn't a problem we can blame the animators for. The CGI is very good in the Hobbit films, and it is clear they did their best. However, nothing can simulate the movements and actions of large groups of people as well as large groups of real people can. For all the bad tactics in the Lord of the Rings trilogy, because most of the battle and action scenes contained real people pretending to kill each other, the action has a sense of authenticity. While the action in The Last Jedi and The Battle of the Five Armies, particularly The Battle of the Five Armies, which mostly takes place in computer-generated scenes, feels less authentic. The bad tactics only add to the sense of inauthenticity in both cases, and become even more apparent as a result.